Welcome to The Doctor Will Hear You Now, a podcast featuring our physicians and other healthcare providers telling their stories, sharing glimpses into their daily work and mission, and showing what it means to practice medicine just a little bit differently. Healing you means hearing you. Let's talk. I'm Lexi. And I'm Ben. And today we're discussing how researchers at Our Lady of the Lake have been working with some of the top minds in the country to solve a really serious problem in emergency room settings, sepsis. Sepsis is the number one killer of people presenting to the ER. It's when the immune system overreacts to a serious infection, attacking more than just the infection itself and damaging tissue and vital organs if not treated early. A lot of times it may go overlooked as the emergency room team works to address the original cause of why you came into the emergency room in the first place. But if sepsis isn't identified and treated, it can create additional problems for the patient and additional obstacles for your care team as well. So we brought in two experts who have been closely involved in some truly astounding research and developments that have taken place at Our Lady of the Lake in recent years. Dr. Bud O'Neill, who is Medical Director of Research at Our Lady of the Lake and a critical care physician at LSU Health Sciences Center, and Dr. Christopher Thomas, who is Medical Director of Quality and Patient Safety for Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System and a critical care physician at LSU Health Sciences Center. So welcome both of you, and thanks for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having us. Good morning. <laughs> so we wanted to start just by helping people get a sense of your roles in our healthcare system. Either of you want to start what a, a typical day in your life and your work looks like. You go ahead, Dr. Thomas. Yeah, so as the director of quality, it, for me, depends on whether I have the pleasure of the job I like the most, which is taking care of patients in a week or whether I'm on purely trying to think about how to improve the quality and safety of patients throughout the health system. Uh, on a typical week, if I am in my quality role, I'll spend a lot of time with our teams at our Lady of the Lake, where we look at different events that have happened through the past week. We talk about what the experience of the patients has been in the health system and in the hospital. We look at honestly, areas where we can improve. And we're very critical of our own selves. The last thing we do in the morning is review all of the safety events, those that were near misses and any other kind of events. And then we make a plan. And that plan usually involves going to our executive tier huddle at nine o'clock to really hear the state of the hospital. And then as the day moves on, it's really for me about trying to drive improvement and typical topics. So we talk about things like how do we improve patients' mobility in the hospital and what are our systems and structures? We talk about how do we make the workflow for our teams, whether that's the nurses, whether it's phlebotomy, how, how do we make their experience better? Because when their experience is better, the patient's experience is better. And then finally, at the end of the day, I think we regroup generally and say, over the next month, what are the things we're trying to achieve and what are the meetings we're going to have to make those things real. Because for us, if you start the day with mom, mother, brother, sister, or father is going to come into the hospital, how do we make sure that month one versus month two, the chance of better care is there at month two? And how do we measure it? How do we make it reproducible? That's my day uh, in a nutshell about what we're thinking about for our community and what we're thinking about for the state of Louisiana. And I'll let Bud talk about how he innovates and then we try to apply his innovations. Yeah, so I'm like Chris, I'm also an ICU physician. And the way I look at my job is it's kind of cut into thirds. So about a third of the time I spend taking care of patients in the ICU. And, you know, we kind of have two specialties, also pulmonary disease too. So a little bit of that time is taking care of patients with lung disease in clinic or, you know, if they're admitted to the hospital. So that's about a third of the time. About a third of the time is research administration. So I'm the medical director of research for Our Lady of the Lake. And my job there is to build relationships with research, to develop research programs. I think it's received a lot of press that Our Lady of the Lake and LSU have created a new partnership. And so part of my job has been working on the research infrastructure for integrating, you know, the clinical care that we provide here at Our Lady of the Lake with some of the incredible research that they do over at LSU, including sports medicine. And so that's been kind of a part of the job is developing some research infrastructure so that we can collaborate with LSU better, as well as developing research programs that collaborate across the country. We have a number of programs where we collaborate with big academic centers like Johns Hopkins University, Vanderbilt University. Some of the work we do is with institutions across the country, like the University of Washington, Missouri, and some places up in Wisconsin. And so really it's, it's about building those relationships for research. And then 
uh, about a third of my job is doing my own research. And, and so that's where like the sepsis work that we do and some of the other work that we do is just kind of my own research. And so that's how I look at my third, you know, third clinical, a third administrative and a third research. Sounds like y'all both have a very full day and week. And so we're grateful for all that you do to help have our patients have a great experience. I'd like to dive into our just more about the sepsis topic and helping our listeners understand this issue and especially in emergency rooms. And so according to the Sepsis Alliance, approximately 30 million adult patients in the U.S. go to the emergency room each year showing signs and symptoms of infection. And around one in five of those emergency room patients are at risk of sepsis. So in simple terms, and just kind of starting from the beginning of just thinking how an average person would understand what sepsis is, can you kind of walk us through really what is sepsis and what are those symptoms that if someone is experiencing sepsis might have? Yeah, Lexi, I'm, I'm going to give you this from the perspective of my family. Uh, thank you to the listeners. It's really important because while we talk about long-term diseases like cancer and heart disease, the honest answer to this question is what is your family likely to experience or for you to have an acute event where you're like, my grandmother's in the hospital? That's sepsis. We all throughout our lives, particularly post-pandemic, have the ability to acquire infection. And so infections when you need treatment can either be you a primary care physician, or if they're really significant, you may need to go to the emergency department. If you go to your primary care physician with an infection and they give you a treatment and it does not work, you may also end up in the emergency department. So when my dad got very sick after a routine procedure, he ended up into the emergency department. And you ask, what does that look like? Well, he was short of breath. He had a change in his ability to think. So he was confused. Yeah. Um, some people have a fever. He didn't have a fever initially, but he developed a fever when he was in the ER. And so the, the thoughts about detection and where families in our community are is, do you think your loved one has an infection? Have they become confused or are they breathing harder than they need to? Because that's related to an acid in the body. When we talk about it in terms of your family, then we also have to ask the question of, man, I, I don't want to stay in a hospital. And right now in the United States, we favor being super aggressive because the disease is super deadly in terms mm -hmm. of the overall numbers, right? We know that patients who develop a change in blood pressure with this disease may have a chance of survival that's one in four, maybe one in five. And so it's a real disease that can impact families truly and honestly within a blink of an eye. What the goal is, is to be able to not only detect those that are really sick, but to make sure that the ones who aren't really sick but do need our care can maybe stay and go home and keep taking care of their families, right? And know that they're not at risk of getting sicker, right? And right now our teams just have these kind of like, how do I take a history and what are these vitals? And then uh, we do outstanding clinical care as it relates to sepsis. But I think Dr. O'Neill's visionary work here and for us as a team is about how do we make from that a everybody and get to find the people that early on are going to get super sick and then earlier on or the mother of two who happens to be in the er who's super nervous because she knows her kids are home and you're trying to get her home right you're trying to say you're safe you can go back to take care of the kids and drop them off on the school bus tomorrow we have a treatment the treatment you're not going to get this thing that we call sepsis which is where when your body responds to the infection it's abnormal yeah. it's exuberant mm -hmm. it overreacts and when it overreacts that's where we need to figure it out because we need to get earlier and then the question is is can we figure out who is going to have this overreaction before they actually have it because right now what we're kind of laced with is the idea that we're only picking up the overreaction in our labs. Like that overreaction is you have to be really sick for us to call it sepsis. So I think from a, a listener perspective, it's really about, can I get an infection? Have I either? When I come to the emergency department, what's my trajectory, right? Am mm -hmm. I really at risk for this thing? Or is it less likely than I'm at risk for it? And then how do you help me and how do I feel confident in the care? Good information for sure. Kind of helps set the scene for us. Well, Dr. O'Neill, I will, you mentioned that sepsis is a part of your research focus that you've taken on yourself. So I was curious what brought you to that topic and what was your initial goal when you started looking into this situation? 
Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, for me and, and I think for, for all of us who do what we do, you know, whether we're emergency me medicine physicians or internists, you know, hospitalists who admit people to the floor or ICU doctors, you know, when you look at sepsis and the way we define sepsis is a little bit interesting. And so the technical definition of it is life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated host response to an infection. So what that means, if you break that down into its pieces, it is life-threatening organ dysfunction. So that is like kidney failure, respiratory failure. In the setting of the brain, it would be brain failure, what we call delirium. So that's the confusion and those things that happen. Cardiovascular failure, things like shock and low blood pressure. All those things are bad. You don't want them to happen. They are life-threatening organ dysfunction. You don't want to lose your kidneys, your brain, your heart, your lungs. And then it's due to this dysregulated host response to an infection. And the way I kind of think about it is, you know, the dysregulated host response is, is as Dr. Thomas was saying, this over-exuberant immune reaction to an infection that may be a relatively mild infection, but then becomes a little severe and your, your immune system just goes crazy and takes out a lot of collateral damage, you know, it destroys organ systems that aren't even involved in the infection. You could have a, a pneumonia, but your immune system damages your kidneys and your brain. So the way I look at it is, you know, living on the Gulf Coast, we get a lot of hurricanes. And the way I look at that definition is, imagine if we only diagnosed or defined a hurricane by the damage that it caused. So I'm from Derrida over near Lake Charles and, and after Laura, driving through there is terrible. Well, what if the only way you could diagnose a hurricane was by the damage that it caused? Well, the people whose houses were destroyed don't, at that point, it's a little late. What you would like to do is tell them, hey, there's a terrible storm coming. We need to prepare for it. Or when that storm's out there, you need to be able to look at that storm and say, you know what, there's a storm out there, but it's just a thunderstorm. It's going to be fine. You don't want people going nuts and shutting down schools and, and you know, making a run on toilet paper and water, right? Just because there's a, a thunderstorm out in the Gulf of Mexico that happens every day. And so that's the way I see sepsis. It is this organ dysfunction, but that seems a little bit late. That's a consequence of the disease. And so what, what occurred to us was that when we look at this, you know, we don't really want to see the damage. We want to see the win. We want to see what's causing the damage, because if we can see what's causing the damage, then maybe we can prepare for it. Or if you have an infection, we want to be able to look at you and say, you know what? Yeah, it's an infection and it's bad, but we, we can take care of that. And this isn't going to develop into something that is going to require the entire resources of the hospital. And it's not going to require an ICU admission and all this crazy stuff that we do, worrying that this could be, you know, a hurricane coming from your immune system. And so that's, that was kind of the premise that we based all of this on. And, and what happened was a long time ago in 2014, just based on a really a serendipitous interaction between two people that neither Chris nor I knew because of an interaction on an airplane, they connected us all. And one of the people on the airplane happened to be a brilliant PhD from MIT who was working with a group that had developed some technology and they thought that they may have something that could work with sepsis. They were having a lot of difficulty finding a clinical partner. So, you know, doctors with access to patients and hospitals that could actually do research with them. So we were connected and, and, you know, Dr. Thomas and I looked at it and said, yeah, we think that this is a, this is an opportunity for us all. Maybe we'll learn something from it. I had a resident who was in need of a research project. And so we said, yeah, let's do this. That's really how we got started was just a serendipitous interaction on an airplane and a couple of willing people. And most importantly, I think for me was a patient population here in Baton Rouge that's incredibly diverse, that is incredibly willing to participate. So every single patient that we enroll, you know, we take their blood, we look at their information. They are willing to give a little bit of themselves for no other reason other than to hopefully make the world a better place. And I think that that's the kind of people that we have. Those are the kinds of people who show up in our emergency department. And I knew we had them. I knew that sepsis was a problem and we saw this opportunity and said, well, let's try to do it. The goal was always to come up with a solution for a problem. And this problem just happens to be one of the biggest that faces healthcare in the United States. It also happens to be, and this is where I'll give credit to the group that we work with. Since, you know, this, we're looking in the emergency department where we can actually make a difference. It's also incredibly difficult because patients walk into the emergency department. And as Dr. Mark Laparus tells us, he's the director of the emergency department here. All he has is a set of vital signs and a story. And that is a very difficult population to work in. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. And so a lot of sponsors and companies who do research just don't want to touch the emergency department because it's so difficult. But this particular sponsor said, you know, this is where we need to do it. So we believe in the technology. We believe in the science. Let's do it. And so I think all those pieces came together and here we are. Okay. So 
Dr. O'Neill, you were talking before about this this partnership. This was the Cytovale yes. partnership? Okay. Yes, this was Cytovale. Uh, biotech, at the time, was a startup, a biotech startup out of San Francisco. I guess technically they're still a startup. That company's evolved a good bit since. Yeah, and it just so happened that they were kind of looking into this or, or interested in this this area at the same time yeah. as you were. Yeah. So what happened with Cytovale was, it, this is a little bit interesting, there was a, a brilliant guy. Cells have different properties. They feel different when you squeeze them based on, in white cells, based on their state of activation. If they're, if they're actively going to look for an infection or if they're just kind of hanging out in the blood. Henry figured out how to do that reproducibly on a scale that nobody had ever seen before. It would take a whole day or two to look at one or two cells. Well, now Henry figured out how to do it tens of thousands of cells in a couple of seconds. And so when they saw this, they said, well, there might be some clinical application for it. This might be useful stuff uh, in medicine. And so they were asking questions of what diseases could we use this to, to kind of assess. And sepsis happened to be one of those. They all got together. Dino, the, the chair of bioengineering said, well, I knew these two people from MIT, hooked them all together. And so Henry and Mara and, and Ajay started this company, Cytovel. And they were in San Francisco looking for, again, a clinical partner, somebody that could actually enroll patients. But that's sometimes a heavy lift for a small company because there's lots of companies out there that will access the patients. And, and that's not easy. It's not cheap. And a startup didn't have a lot of money. And so they randomly, again, through this interaction on an airplane, ran into us and we said, sure, why not? Let's, this sounds interesting. Let's give it, give it a shot. Yeah. Talk about like divine intervention, right? That y'all were on the plane at the right time to connect with them to start well, this work. I'll tell you how that really happened. It, it This is an interesting story. I think that, the, 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 to me, the, the, the takeaway from this is don't let any opportunity go at least unexplored. You know, you don't yeah. have to, you don't have to actually pursue it, but you should also always think about it. The reason I always tell our residents about this is, you know, you should always listen. You never know who you're going to sit by. You should always be willing to strike up a conversation and see what people have, because you never know which random interaction with a person, you know, it's kind of like the butterfly effect, yeah. it flaps, flaps its wings, you know, how, how is that going to impact you down, down the road? And, and not all of them work out, but sometimes it does, but I can, I can tell you this, it, it never works out if you're not willing to talk to people and hear what they have to say. Definitely. I think that's great advice for anyone in any walk of life. I know that we have been working with Cytoval on the project for since 2014, so quite a while now. And so can you talk about what it's been like seeing this work come to life and how as an actual test that this is truly a benefit to septic patients, the work that's being done here in this research? Yeah. You know, the first study we did in 2014, the question was, can we even can you even take blood from a human and run it through this test and, and get something out of it? You know, I mean, we it was that simple. It wasn't a, hey, can this test detect sepsis? We were not even there. It was just a, can this machine that was built in San Francisco be transported down to Louisiana, put a lab somewhere? We were fortunate because Pennington gave us a little bit of lab space that we could put it. You know, again, we were fortunate because our patients are incredible and are willing to, to give a little bit of themselves for this. But we learned a lot in that first study. We learned that the, the heat and humidity of Louisiana does interesting things to, to uh, you know, technology. Um, yep. And so, you know, all kinds of things we learned. We did that first study and we said, you know what? We can actually get results out of this, but we have some work to do. And so then the question was, well, how do we translate? Okay, yeah, we can, we can get some results to can we make this a diagnostic test for sepsis? And so that took some work, both on the technology side by side of L to try to perfect the technology and figure out how how we can actually make this portable in all different climates and environments and all those things. And, and some work on our part to try to figure out, you know, what is sepsis? Because that, that in and of itself is a different thing. Sepsis is, is a disease that's, or I, I would argue it's not a disease, but it's kind of a syndrome whose definition has evolved over since about 1990. And so about every 10 years, somebody decides to update the definition. So how do we kind of understand this disease, develop an understanding so that we can develop hopefully a diagnostic that won't suddenly become obsolete as soon as somebody changes the definition of the disease, which they could definitely do. Yeah. And so we did a lot of work there. And then in 2016, did one of the larger studies that we did where we enrolled 400 patients from Our Lady, the, predominantly Our Lady of the Lake, about 70, 80% from Our Lady of the Lake and about 20% from Baton Rouge General to try to develop our understanding of this test as it relates to sepsis. 
interestingly, during that time, the definition of sepsis did change. Mm-hmm. And so we did have to do a good bit of work on the clinical side, meaning looking at the patients and understanding the disease so that, again, our understanding of the disease was truly biology and not just some definition that a group of people applied to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what is a hurricane? It's not just a bad storm that causes damage, you know, but it, it, there's a very, you know, if you ask a meteorologist, it has a very specific definition and yes, it causes some damage. And so that's kind of what we were going to is what is this disease really? Ultimately, we figured out that, yes, we could do this. And then after a little bit more work, we said, all right, we think we have the technology perfected enough. We think we have our clinical understanding perfected enough. Let's put them all together. And then in 2019, we did one more study. And this was kind of like the trial run, the practice run, right? This is, you know, this is, this is the, you know, the spring game, right, for football. We're going to put the first team out there, first team offense against the first team defense. We're going to see how this works out. We got really promising, really great results. We were ready to then do a big study to get this technology FDA clear. Because to go to the FDA, you have to have a lot of data, a lot of information. It has to be very rigorous, very meticulous with data capture and all those things. Because they want to make sure that you're not falsifying your data. And so we were getting ready to do that. And then there's good serendipity and bad serendipity. And then we all know what happened in March 2020. And so that really was interesting for us because that COVID changed everything. But Cytobel being a good partner said, well, maybe this is an opportunity too. So we don't know what this disease COVID is. In April of 2020, before we really even had good PCR, now you can't even imagine that you couldn't get a COVID test. Yeah. I mean, but there was a time when we couldn't get a COVID test. People would show up in the ED hundreds at a time and they would say they're short of breath and you didn't know if it was COVID or a cold or or heart attack or what, and they would just get admitted to the hospital. And so the hospital was just absolutely full. And so with Cytovel, we said, well, can we use this test to find who's sick and who's not? And so we did a study in April, 2020, and ultimately found that yes, even in, in this disease that we don't understand, uh, this test, this Cytovel test can find those patients who are really sick and at risk of dying from the disease versus those patients who are just not that sick and probably could go hang out at home. Well, of course, the doctors, we didn't know. We couldn't tell. And so everybody's just in the hospital. The hospital's full of people who weren't all that sick. But then the, the danger was that when somebody would get sick, we didn't have the space to take care of. And so we went through that. And then ultimately in 2021 was when we performed the big study with University of Washington, University of Missouri, and Wake Forest, and then submitted it to the FDA. So that was kind of our evolution in this. What I guess is is next for the test? It's being implemented in our systems and in hospitals across the country? What's, what's yeah, happening there? This is, this is one where the plan is to implement this, to take this test now at FDA cleared. And we want to say, how can we use this test to make sepsis care better? This is where Dr. Thomas and I, our roles really, really come together. My team, the research team, we try to advance knowledge. And then once we get that knowledge, Dr. Thomas's job is to implement that knowledge. And so I'm going to let him talk to you about how he plans to implement this test in the process of sepsis care within our hospitals. Thanks, bud. I think what also undersells the genius in developing research trials. So I'll, I'll say this for the audience. There are few people in the United States that can develop and design clinical trials at this level. It's probably in the numbers of 20 and his background and training at Vanderbilt in terms of master's of science and clinical investigation as the only one in the region essentially is really important because in order to understand and develop science, you have to understand how to ask the question and you have to be more interested in the question than you are the answer. And so his, his genius is being interested in the question and the patient and not the answer. And then my job is to take, if we get an answer to figure out how to apply that answer consistently, uniformly, and robustly. So while he was working through the trial design and as we were rolling patients at the same time in the health system and specifically in the batteries market, we had engaged in something called sepsis learning health, where we were trying to make sure that as we evaluated patients in the ER, that we did it the same way with importance in the same fashion every time. And so we worked with our information technology experts, Dr. Tanya Jagno, was really critical for this because she actually studied some of the new technologies that Epic had brought out with, and has actually presented that nationally. We went to the nurses and said, tell us about your workflow. Like, tell me about what happens and how do we elevate this conversation? The audience will all understand that 
we're elite at taking care of heart attack, particularly when there's a clot in the heart. And we are really, really good at getting you to there. We're really, really good at stroke as well in this region. And the reason is because those all have a point in time that we know of, right? One is a CAT scan with symptoms. One is a EKG, which for the audience is essentially looking at the electrical waveforms of the heart and associated with chest pain. Throughout this disease, we did not have that start, right? We didn't know, okay, here we go, right? How do we start the race? What's the thing that says? All right, so we had a bunch of people running the race and we didn't know exactly where they were in their journey. So we decided we needed to make the lanes exactly the same. We need to be able to study the lanes. We need to make sure when we came out of the lane, how do we do it repeatedly and reliably so that no matter what time you come in, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, you get the exact same care. So we elevated sepsis to the same level of heart attack and stroke. And so from a quality perspective, that was really the generation of what's our data look like? How are we doing? And what we saw were our public reported data got better. We started training people better and we became really reliable and consistent in identifying people in our emergency room who had sepsis. So you ask them what the next step is. The next step is, is all of those people get lots of different treatment, right? So they have a standard thing. And so you come to our emergency department, we say, we think you have sepsis. And so as a result, we give you antibiotics, big antibiotics. And if you have low blood pressure, we give you big fluids. And then the nurses will all draw blood cultures, right? And we're going to do that every time. And we're going to monitor that every day, every month. And we're going to give feedback to where we potentially had an opportunity to improve. Once we solidify that in terms of the sepsis learning health platform, that's where this test becomes important. Because now that we know we can do that standard work at national best practice, now it's how do you innovate? And so what we designed over the last two months is, is if this was going to work and we're going to implement it, you have to do it in the same spot, same time, and know and teach and train to it so that patients aren't exposed to some new technology, which changes our standard of care. So what we've done now is redone our electronic medical record across not only the battery market, but the whole health system to allow for the test to help the patient. And so the goal is, is if you come into our emergency department, we ask those questions, we would ask my father, right? Do I think I'm the nurse? I'm looking at you. Do I think you have an infection, right? Did something you tell me, tell me you think I have an infection? Am I confused, right? Am I breathing fast? And then we'll take the vitals. If those then signal to us that it's likely that you have the possibility of sepsis, we will do labs that we have been doing for the last three years. And we will add in this test. And this test comes back in about seven to 10 minutes. We think it may help 20 to 30 patients a day in the emergency department. And if you can just imagine being that patient now who comes in, who now we're in eight minutes able to know, do we have a hurricane or do we just have a thunderstorm, right? Mm -hmm. Where am I putting you? Because a hurricane's going into our critical care area and our teams are going to respond to you in the same way we do stroke, STEMI. We're going to be able to tell you what we think you have more confidently, right? And then if you just have a thunderstorm, we're going to tell you, hey, we're going to take care of you, but we don't think that this is going to turn into something that's going to be life-changing and life-altering right at this day, at least not for the next three days based on the test. And so that's really about trying to apply evidence-based medicine. And our goal in the health system in coordination with Dr. Neil, who creates the scientific knowledge in my role and trying to apply consistently, repeatedly, that knowledge is then to keep studying, right? Who, where, what times, like where is it the most valuable? And then to start to keep going what we call learning health because just when you get the test approved and you use a test, your job is not done. It's then to optimize the test, optimize it for the community, and then to make it available, right? And then for us to think about is we worry about this region and other regions in Louisiana where we're 50th in the country and outcomes. How do we get us from 50 to 40? And is this one of the tools that we can utilize now, something we've never had before to take out the randomness and then start to help everybody in Louisiana and then potentially even in Mississippi? That's the part that from a quality perspective about is really application in a standard form of novel technology after we've been very clear that we've been robust in our study, we can poison our study, and we've just said we're interested in the structure and the process, and now we think we can impact, hopefully, the people in our community to not get so sick. Wow, that's really helpful to understand, and it sounds like work that's really helping processes 
and caretakers and for providers. And you mentioned a little bit about how, you know, for heart conditions and stroke, there is a starting point or a cause that we know of. And with sepsis, it's something that researchers still to be, seem unsure about what is the, the cause of that. And this test really seemed to help advance more of that research. Do you feel that there are more advances coming in understanding and treating sepsis because of this work that you're laying the groundwork for? Yeah. So, you know, the way, the way it works right now, if you look at how we treat sepsis current state, so today you walk in any hospital in the United States, any hospital that has a great process, a process like Dr. Thomas has implemented here and not only Our Lady of the Lake, but all of the FMOL hospitals, for every five people you treat for sepsis, maybe one of them has sepsis. The other four have something else. We're trying to change that so that for every five people you treat for sepsis, at least four of them do, right? So you're really trying to, to, to change that. And the other one probably has an infection that's really bad. And, and hopefully what you've done is you've, you've just caught it before they actually develop sepsis. And so what we're trying to do is, is tilt the scales that way. And one of the ways that this test can help further our understanding of sepsis is when I design a clinical trial for sepsis now, since we don't know when it happened and, it, and it's a very, what we call nonspecific presentation, meaning it just, sepsis when you walk in the door can look like a thousand other things. Now, the same thing applies when you try to study sepsis. For every five people you study for sepsis, one of them has it. So you have to study a hundred people just to study 20 who actually really have it. The other problem is that, again, those other 80 don't have it and shouldn't be in the study. They shouldn't be in the research, but we can't tell that. We just don't know. So this test can help by really identifying those patients who really have it up front within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of coming into the emergency department. So it can really change how we do research on sepsis and that can help drive answering some of these questions. How do I prevent the organ failure? What do I do? What do I use specifically to treat sepsis? What is it about this patient and that infection that caused this problem? Because if you think about it, you know that the, the number of bacteria and viruses and fungi out there is just astounding. We are an incredibly beautifully diverse group of people who all have a slightly different response to whatever infection that is. So when you multiply the number of what we call pathogens or infections multiplied by the number of different responses that we might have, that, that number is just unreal. And that's why no two cases of sepsis really look alike. And so what we're saying is we can see that biology, we can see that wind, and we can really help find those patients who have it. And then if we want to study, do a deeper dive on those patients, we can really find out what is their predisposition? Why did they behave this way? What treatment is there that can hopefully prevent this complication of sepsis in that patient? And so that's where I think this technology will drive research. Most importantly for us is driving clinical care. We want to make patients better. And what we've understood and what Dr. Thomas has done a, a great job of is understanding that if you just take care of the patients, all of the other things tend to sort themselves out. Take best care of the patients, then you can deliver more efficient care, more effective care, more appropriate care to the right patients. Get people home who need to be home, put them in the hospital when they need the hospital. Don't spend a ton of money. Don't waste resources on people who don't have it so that you can devote all of those resources to the people that do. That's good to hear. And I think that that sort of speaks to another question I had. And I think Dr. Thomas, you might have answered this in a way in terms of quality is how this fits into what our health system's mission is and our priority about listening to patients, hearing their stories, being that full partner in health. So how do you see this work playing into that, that mission? Yeah, I, I think this is critical, right? I think the first step in sepsis is the listening. And the second step in sepsis management is the healing. And in order to be able to do that effectively, sometimes you need to innovate. I think we take for granted the ability to link those two. And so as a quality person, I can focus with our team. We have one of the best performance improvement and quality teams, I think, in the Southeast, led by Leon Teague, Lindsay Bodie. Christy Pierce, I, I, I mean, they're world-class. The answer is, is I think sometimes we assume those two are connected. And as a provider, as a clinician, sometimes I listen and I frustrate in the ability to heal. And so this application of technology says, help me recognize who I can heal, help me recognize when I can do it. 
And then from a health system perspective, this is really about what the mission is, right? We are committed to providing care for everyone from all walks of life at every time, right? The sisters came here over a hundred years ago with a very easy message. And it is when someone shows up, take care of them, listen to them, right? Technology and others have moved us away from listening. We spend less time in chairs, looking at people in the eye and more time on phones, and more times than the need more. The hope here is that by using an innovative technology, I can then come back or our teams or any person can walk in and learn, sit down in a chair and have a confident conversation after listening to them and say, we believe and we are confident with certain amount that we are on the right track to heal. Right. So I think this is part of what our entire ethos is. And I think the sisters would, if we went all the way back to Monroe and all of the challenges and the struggles they had, I think this is essentially what they were thinking about, right? Like how do we move forward in our role? And the other part, I think it's, Bud may have mentioned is, is he's developed a test that's agnostic to your history, agnostic to your, your background, right? It is really what we think about in true equality, right? We are getting to you in personalized medicine with your white self. And so if there is the potential for any challenges or struggles where I don't feel comfortable giving you my history, if I'm trying to listen to you, but for some reason, something in your background has not allowed you to give me the history because of trust or others, this test can help facilitate that, right? So we also are beginning to overcome, I think, some of the both unconscious bias and biases and struggles in healthcare delivery that we've seen in the past. And this is a way for us to be able to go back if the test comes back in a way and say, hey, let's walk through again what, what really has been going on over the last couple of days and just, just let me be honest with me about what you've been feeling, right? And so I, I, hopefully it's a test that increases the amount of listening and not the opposite to which most technology does. That's beautifully put. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. I agree. I think anything that we can do to help innovate starts with listening, hearing from the patient. And so during those, the trials or since the tests have been implemented, do you have any stories to share about patients who saw better outcomes because of this work or because in the treatment because of the sepsis tests? I can tell you some experiences that we've had on the research end where we look at it, we say, wow, had we known this would be really game changing for these patients. When we were, this is a story I tell frequently, when we were in submission with the FDA, there's a lot of kind of back and forth with the FDA, as you could imagine. Yeah. They asked for a couple of patients who had the highest scores possible on the test. So like, you know, kind of the, the highest high that, that you can get. And those are fortunately not easy patients to find. Just out of point of context, out of the 572 patients we enrolled in the, in the study, about 10 or 12 of them would have met the criteria that the FDA wanted. So it's a pretty low percentage. And so it's very difficult. And it, if it were easy to find those patients, we wouldn't need the tests too, right? Yeah. But so we had, you know, our emergency department has been just absolutely incredible. They've worked with us for, you know, eight, nine years on this. And, and they have a really good understanding of what we do. And so they were all on the lookout for the sickest of the sick the quote unquote, most septic patient they could find. And so one day they called and they said, I got one, but you need to hurry because he's not doing well. Uh, and so I run and I, I, I get to the emergency department, find the, the, the patient. He was very sick, unable to you know, have a discussion himself. I find his wife, I had a discussion with her about what we were doing, what kind of research we were doing. She understood that, you know, we're, we're trying to do something that improves the health of others and said, yes, you can enroll him. You can take his blood and, and see what happens. Well, it turns out that he didn't have the highest of the high. He had one of the lowest of the low <laughs> scores on the test and, and all of the emergency department. And then he was admitted to the intensive care unit and everybody thought that he had sepsis. And of course, we don't find out the research results until much later. And fortunately, the gentleman ended up doing, doing well, but it took over 24 to almost 48 hours to figure out that this, this patient was not having a septic shock and uh, an episode of septic shock. He was in cardiogenic shock, which can look all exactly like sepsis, except that the treatments are opposite. So in cardiogenic shock, you get fluid off and sepsis, you get fluids to the patient and, you know, in septic shock, you give antibiotics and blood cultures In cardiogenic shock, there's no role for blood cultures. And so it took the doctors 24 to 48 hours to figure out what was going on. Whereas we could have told them that within 10 minutes. 
Unfortunately, it was researched and we didn't have the results and couldn't, couldn't communicate those results at the time. But when I look at cases like that, I say, you know, these are the kinds of things that we can do. This is the kind of difference that we can make. Everybody knows about antibiotic resistance. And it's because we overuse antibiotics because sepsis is so bad. When a patient comes in, you want to treat everybody for sepsis, you know, and like I said before, four out of five people that you treat before sepsis don't actually have sepsis. So you're giving these broad spectrum antibiotics to people and something that one of Chris and I, one of our mentors, Dr. Art Wheeler, who unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, said one day that there are only two classes of medications that impact not only the patient that you give, but also all the patients around that. And that is nuclear medicine. So radioactive medicines that we give people sometimes and antibiotics. Because when you give antibiotics, you are altering the bacteria that is in that patient and those bacteria will spread to other people. That's just the way this works. If we can limit the amount of broad spectrum antibiotics that we use only to, and use only the people that really need it, then we can limit things like antimicrobial resistance. We can make the hospitals, we can make our community safer. When people do get sepsis, it does make it easier to treat because we have options to treat when, when there is less antibiotic resistance. And so those are the kinds of differences that we can make, both short-term that impact individual patients and then long-term that impact not only those patients, but our entire population, all of the people that we come in contact with. The one thing that we've learned about bacteria and viruses, I think we learned this in COVID, you know, they don't care what you look like. They don't care how much money you make. They don't care where you live. They don't care what you believe in. The bacteria and the viruses just do what they do and they don't care and neither should we. And we should take care of everybody the same because we're all in this together. That's such a good point to make for sure. And I, I think it's, it's worth reiterating that this is such a game changer on the national level this research and to be here with you talking about it, this work that you're doing, it, it started here at the lake. And so I guess what, what could you tell us about in general, the research work that we do and the clinical trials that we do here that might be surprising for people who aren't familiar with just how innovative we actually are here? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start by talking a little bit about the research that we do, and then I'll hand it off to Dr. Thomas to talk about an area that, that begins the border from research into translating all that into quality, because he does some work that's absolutely incredible that in all honesty, nobody else can do. So it's a little interesting, but we do a lot of research here at Our Lady of the Lake. A, a lot of people don't quite understand the kind of research that we do, but obviously we've talked about sepsis. We have a, a very strong infectious disease community. We do a lot of work with anti-infectives. So looking at treatments for different antibiotics, new antibiotics, antivirals, we have a number of those studies. We have a very active trauma research program. And so one of the things that we're concerned about is that when people have traumatic injuries out in the community, they come to the hospital, we want to give them best outcomes. Best outcomes for us isn't only survival. That is very clearly a piece of the best outcome, but we want a functional survival. Like Dr. Thomas said, we want you back home doing what you were doing before you came to us. And so we've recently started a collaboration with Johns Hopkins University, where we're part of a large research network looking at trauma, especially neurotrauma and cardiac arrest, things that happen out in the community and how we can improve and facilitate that care as those patients transition from home into the critical care setting, the trauma setting, the critical care setting, and that kind of resuscitative phase. That's interesting research because a lot of that research starts where the paramedics pick up the patient. And so there is not time to consent the patient for research there. And so that requires a lot of community engagement, community support. And I think that those are projects that we haven't started yet, but we're going to soon. And so I think that that will become more and more apparent as we engage the community and the participation in research uh, on that end. We do a tremendous amount of cancer research, looking at not only outcomes for cancer, how do patients do a specific therapy, but looking for that therapy, specific therapy for those patients. If you have this kind of cancer, we can deliver this kind of therapy for you. Dr. John Lyons is one of our oncologic surgeons, and he, he does a lot of work in surgical oncology. And so the best way to, you get chemo before surgery, surgery before chemo, what kind of surgery do you get? What kind of outcomes do we have from, from certain operations? We have a, a very engaged physician community and patient community in research. And then I'll let Dr. Thomas talk to you about how we study not only the individual research, but the implementation of what we've learned back onto our patients so that we can understand, are these things that we're learning in research improving those functional outcomes for those patients? Yeah, I think one of the beauties of research and programs like the sepsis program has been you also gain national attention by partnership. And so 
you know, when we started this work as an idea and a framework essentially for integrated quality and in research, and when you talk about true learning health, that's integration of the two and connectivity to it, you need to have access to large other academic medical centers. Through this work initially and Dr. O'Neill's connections, now we have multiple programs that run. So we do high-end ER research with uh, Louis and Barnett, who is one of the ER providers who's investigating kind of what we do in the ER. That's called pragmatic critical care trials research. It's really about let's study the things we already were doing every day. Those partners are the, the national elites, right? They're the UAVs, they're the Vanderbilts. We have NIH trials going on in terms of COVID and new therapeutics. And then one of the things that I'm proud of is that we blend research over to quality. And so we, about four years ago, joined with John Hopkins at University of Colorado and Christiana Care. And we said, how do we start to study or look at what we do for patients in the hospital as they relate to mobility? That was a research project that was with lots of partners saying, hey, what's your patient experience in the hospital? And you and I come to the hospital and we jump in bed. That's odd. That was a normal for most patients. That's not normal at home. Spending 80% of the bed at home makes you bed bound. But when you come to the hospital, particularly here in, in the deep south of Louisiana, you know, we, we want you to rest. But when you look at the functional status, that's actually the opposite. We want, don't want bed rest. We want mobility. So so we studied and, and, and Bud mentioned this briefly about, can we actually change an entire culture of how we think about delivery of medicine opposite to kind of the archetypes and what we did for a long time, right? Like your grandma always told you you're sick, go lay in bed, right? Well, in reality, <laughs> go to a chair, stay upright most of the time, help your nutrition be beneficial, but stay active. But so we've been looking at that over the last three years in partnership with Mike Freeman out of John Topkins. And so looking at how do we change the whole health system and whole health delivery, right? Again, in this whole research it, figure out what the opportunity is and then apply it. And how do you maximize the amount of patients who get that benefit? We have taken a little bit of a unique approach. These are two of the more difficult topics. Everyone is very firm and convinced they know the answer that when you come in, you should get met, right? That's <laughs> Trying to change an entire population of healthcare workers over years, that may have not been the best idea. And then on the same, I, you know, I, I don't think Bud and I would tell you that we've met probably, you know, a thousand physicians who are clear. They know exactly what sepsis was. They can identify it. They were perfect at saying you had it. And when you really look at it, you have to have some self-assessment skills that we need some help. So those are two of the roles, I think, in application. So one about mobility, this one about sepsis that work together from a regional medical center and then from a health system perspective of. Uh, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, it is okay to be that hospital. That's necessary in towns like I grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia, which is a community hospital, right? Community hospitals are necessary for, but what's necessary for states and populations is innovative, large academic medical centers who are willing to ask the question and not be convinced they have the answer. And so. We're not convinced we have the answer on mobility. We're changing the whole way we do it. And then the same way as we just talked about over time, we weren't convinced we had the answer on sepsis. And so now the conversation is how do you help others, right? Not just our own health system, but the whole state, right? That's our, our mission. We should share. And so you don't, you don't pull back on safety and quality. You share. People may not listen, but you try to give the message and you try to tell, hey, we have something that we think is going to help your mother or uncle who's in Thibodeau or somewhere else, right? How do we expand the reach of an FMLHS and sharing? Because you could, shouldn't compete on safety. You should enhance safety for the entire community. So that's, that's kind of where we are in connectivity is an integrated learning health and, and kind of quality of research go together. Fortunate to have a great partner here, but I just have to try to apply some. Yeah, imagine, so, you know, the, the kind of paradigm shift that Dr. Thomas is pushing is, you know, so the things we do in research usually answer specific questions. The kind of paradigm shift that Dr. Thomas is affecting here is you, you've heard it a thousand times when somebody comes into the hospital, the nurse hands him a gown and says, here, you know, change into this gown and lie in the bed, right? Like that's what you hear. Imagine the answer is now, hey, change into this gown, sit in the chair, not don't lie in the bed. Or instead of, yes, we'll bring this to you. Hey, we're going to come get you and we're going to take a walk to go do these things. That's, that's a paradigm shift that we're not used to. And, and that's a difficult one, but those are the kinds of things that Dr. Thomas is affecting because again, if you can sit in the chair, you can stand up and go to the bathroom, you can take care of yourself, 
that increases the probability that you're going to be discharged to home, not another facility. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thanks for sharing that philosophy and that understanding of shifting the culture. I think, I mean, it makes sense of when you have a cold and you wake up and that's like the worst you feel, right? It's like right when you wake up. But once you get moving, you're kind of like, okay, this is not so bad. You know, I feel better. But if you stayed down all day, you're just like, oh, I'm just so sick, you know? I mean, it makes sense that as you keep moving, that you start to feel better in other illnesses or sicknesses that you may have. And I know that's a a big culture shift here in the South, for sure. <laughs> well, we always have one fun question we like to ask our guests. I think this is kind of my favorite question because I like to just hear the different responses that we get. But what are you listening to these days? It could be, you know, something fun, fun thing that you listen to, music, podcasts, audiobooks, whatever, or it could be professional. But what's on your playlist? Go first. Oh, wow. Yours <laughs> is going to be more elite than mine is. No. Oh. So this is going to be... St- Super on brand with this topic and, and embarrassing because I should be giving you things like uh, I am excited about my future Taylor Swift concert or <laughs> I'm really, I'm really into like Brothers Osborne. And so I'm listening mm-hmm. to, but quite frankly, li- recently on the drive, I've been listening to a podcast. It's called the ICU and Ed podcast. Uh, and it's by two Todd Rice and another critical care physician. And it, it's really just an, an interesting education about uh, learning about science and how they think about science. And, and what they do is each time there's a, a new article and a way to learn, but it's really less about the content and more about the approach to the content. And so mm-hmm. by listening to others think, uh, it's been helpful for me, which sounds really, really like I don't have a life. And <laughs> Rob is not music right now. And I just right. referenced a work podcast hopefully that gets cut from the episode or <laughs> he looks at it because they're gonna be learning about early mobility in the ICU and things like that but that's that's been the recent drive to work yeah mine's a little different and this is probably why dr thomas is a better doctor than i am but i do have two teenage daughters there's a little bit of taylor swift that goes on but so i, I listen to two things there's a german philosopher i can't remember his name but he said the only thing that we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history and so i've been listening to a lot of american history at my favorite is a podcast called American History Tellers, done by a guy named Lindsey Graham, who's not that Lindsey Graham. But <laughs> so, and so I, I do that. And then I intertwine that with music. And I don't have a particular genre in music. I'm always struck by lyricists and their ability to communicate. Mm-hmm. So my favorite is Adam Duritz of the Counting Crows. But then there's a smattering of, I mean, of course, everybody, if you're, if you love lyrics, you have to love Bob Dylan. But there's a smattering of other things out there. So I, that's, that's usually what drives the music I listen to is, is some, you know, like Shrek says, it's it's like an onion. So anything that you can feel back layers to and listen to, but the ability to communicate is something that I can't do. So I'm always trying. So you try to turn off the the research brain and Dr. Thomas is still. He embraces yeah, it. Yeah. 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 Like I said, there's a, there's a reason he does what I do and I do what I do. <laughs> 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 Am I really been the honest answer to that is that means that Bud is a whole person. And I am half a person. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what, I, what I'm telling you, what I'm listening to is the ICU Ed and Toddcast. That 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 means that I really, after this, sh- there should be an intervention. I think I'm I'm, I'm going to walk out of here and listen to Crying Crows because that's, <laughs> really, that's that's what I that'll do. Help. That'll, that'll help. Mm-hmm. Well, no, don't don't stop because I get my medical information from Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I count on him to actually listen to that stuff and tell me what's important. <laughs> well, before we wrap up, is there anything else you wanted to maybe stress to our listeners? I got one thing. It, what I want the listeners to recognize is we are blessed to live in a community that both has a commitment to learning and the learning meaning the research. And we are blessed to be in an area where we have a lot of extraordinarily talented people as it relates to quality, safety, and infection prevention, and others who I don't think people really understand how good they are. And sometimes if you don't know, because no one tells you, you can't. I think the community would benefit from understanding that there are people who don't think they have the answers and they are listening and they just continue to do that because sometimes in communities where you don't really have that, you hear stories. But the stories have to equal results, right? And people have to be willing to listen to change. And, and we're kind of blessed in that way and that we have a group that 
says, I don't know. And then says, but I'm going to figure it out. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think for me, it's the, it's our patients. So when I look at, for example, the sepsis work we do, we've enrolled a couple of thousand patients here in this community that have, have willingly participated again, you know, kind of giving them a little bit of themselves to make the world a better place. And when you look at our community, it's just, it's, it's wonderfully diverse. It's beautiful, just absolutely wonderful people. And uh, I would encourage everybody who comes into the hospital to ask about research, ask about participating. We tell people all the time, you can't take the next step from the back of the line. That means that you only advance from the front of the line. Dr. Thomas's job is to, is to keep that line in order and to keep us at the cutting edge. It's my job to look for that next step. And then, you know, we look for the next step and make sure it's a safe step. Dr. Thomas says, okay, we're moving to it but it's the patients that make it happen. I think that for me, it's just this absolutely incredible patient population that we have. And then our research staff here, I'm fortunate. I work with a research nurse, Jen Daigle, who is able to communicate that with patients. I mean, she just has the ability to communicate and enroll patients and, and you know, tell them that it's okay and it's safe to do so. But that that's our whole research staff here. I think that they do an, an absolutely wonderful job and are very connected with community. When you look at how we enroll patients, an example is in most sepsis studies, you'll you read them the, they enroll around 5% African-American patients. That, that is not what my patient population looks like. If you come to my ICU, if you walk in our ER, you are not going to see, you know, 5% African-American patients. We enroll here 45 to 50% African-American patients. That's what our patient population looks like. We need to understand our patients. I need to be able to extrapolate our data to patients who look like population that looks like my patient so that we can make our patients better. And I think that that's, that's the power of, of where we are and what we can do. And, and it tells us the true, you know, the true kind of sense of community that we have. That's great. Thank you so much for both of you for joining us today. I know we took a little bit extra of your time, but we so appreciate it. And it's really just great to hear the work that you're doing. And we appreciate the work that you're doing to help our communities. Thank y'all for talking to us. Had a good time. It's been fun. <laughs> Thank y'all. I'm going to go listen to an ICU podcast. (laughs) (laughs) And listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll have everything our doctor has mentioned and other helpful resources linked in the show notes. And we'll be back soon with more episodes of The Doctor Will Hear You Now, a podcast from Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System. If you have ideas for topics you'd like to hear on the show, email us at podcast at fmolhs.org. Thanks for listening.